I moved to Denmark from the UK in 1997. I'd studied law, gone travelling, met a truly wonderful Dane, and we moved in together. Since then, I've spent over 20 years working in investment and finance. I've experienced the burst of the tech bubble, followed by a boom, followed by the bust of the global financial crisis in 2008, and the consequences of that seismic event that continue to have such an impact on our world today. I was becoming disenchanted, both with business and maybe a bit with myself. Then in 2015, I started teaching. One of the subjects that I teach is social entrepreneurship, a course about businesses with a social mission, as opposed to one based purely on creating profit. Some of these are standalone ventures, some are part of a network, some are self-financing, some rely on public or private grants and donations. Many are also a mix, but all have as their core function an intention to set right an imbalance or an injustice in our societies and communities. In a world beset by a pandemic, a climate crisis and political polarisation, finding the light can be tough. These days, we all need a bit of hope. Teaching social entrepreneurship gives me hope. This is a group of my students out on a ride with some seniors from a local residential home through the Amalienborg Palace in downtown Copenhagen. The Queen lives in one of these, the Crown Prince in another. My students come from all over the US, DIS where I teach, being a study abroad programme. And not all the students felt so comfortable on a bike, as you might be able to spot from the guy on the left there who's nearly falling off. We've been talking in class about a social business called Cycling Without Age. Cycling's a big thing in Denmark. Over half the working population of Copenhagen use a bike as their primary mode of transport on their daily commute. And if, like me, you ride a bike, you know how great biking feels, the thrill of the wind in your hair and the sense of freedom that biking brings. So imagine biking for all your life and having that taken away from you just because your body is letting you down. And then couple that with an isolated life in a nursing home where you might only get outside and feel the sun on your face a couple of times a year. In 2012, the younger of these two guys, whose name is Ola, Cycle past the same elderly gentleman on his daily commute. All have thought that he looked like he missed cycling, so he decided to do something about it. He hired a bike rickshaw, rocked up at a local care home, and asked the staff if any of the residents wanted to come out for a ride. And they did. Cycling Without Age is now an organisation which spans 50 countries with over 2,200 individual locations, getting pensioners out of their care homes and back in the open air. They've served over 1.5 million people globally, have an army of volunteers and corporate partnerships with companies such as Airbnb. My students didn't stop talking about that day, about how they'd never made a, pers a personal connection like that with an elderly person that they'd just met, about how powerful it was to see the joyful effect that the ride had on our passengers, and how they'd never really thought about what social isolation felt like when you were elderly and living in a care home, but now they got it. It's through experiences like this that I realise what a powerful force for empowering transformative change social enterprise is. If you've heard of social entrepreneurship before, it might bring to mind clean water projects in Africa or microfinance in India or other projects targeted at the developing world. But social enterprises have just an important place in developed economies, even ones with a welfare state as strong as Denmark. So here's another example. If you think about an urban space in a modern capital city, what kind of images, smells and senses does that bring to mind? Crowds, traffic noise, probably doesn't smell too great. Well, how about a sense of tranquility, the scent of flowers and the buzzing of bees? because that is exactly what another social business is bringing to Copenhagen. One fateful night in the city, Oliver Maxwell accidentally rode his bike into a beehive and was struck with the inspiration that led to booby. Booby means city bee in English. It's hard to talk to Oliver about the business and the purpose of work in general without your head feeling like it might implode. It's such an inspiring and radically different way of looking at what businesses are and what they can do. And that's not just my opinion. I hear it from all our students who volunteer there. On the face of it, Booby set up beehives on rooftops and other urban spaces all over Copenhagen and harvest the honey. 
which amazingly to me at least, has got a different color and flavor depending on where in the city it comes from. But Bubi does much more than that. Of course, it's beneficial for the local honeybee population and the flora that they pollinate in the city. But they bring in people on the edge of society and give them an income, purpose and dignity. And then there's biodiversity. Like many places, Denmark's got a huge biodiversity problem. When I first came here, I imagined mountainous Scandinavian vistas bedecked with woodland and forest, which shows you how much research I'd done in advance. Most of Denmark's actually flat as a pancake, with only 21% of that land being forest or open countryside, and a huge 62% being agricultural or farmland. So there's precious little natural habitat for insects and wild animals to thrive. So maybe the most vital role of booby is that they connect local Copenhageners with the nature in their environment, so they appreciate, treasure and engage with what they might otherwise have barely noticed. Another example. One of my favourite spots in Copenhagen, it's a craft beer bar. Its colour scheme is a bit special. The craft beer world isn't known for its shades of bright pink and stripy deck chairs. But that's because the brewing company, which owns the bar, called People Like Us, is a very special company. People Like Us is a social business whose beers include collaborations with some of the most famous and well-respected breweries in the world. And I can confirm that with plenty of personal experience, they taste great too. What's radical about people like us is their team, over 75% of whom have one or more psychological diagnoses. Some are autists, some have ADHD, some have anxiety or a depression, some are war veterans suffering from PTSD. Some work full-time, some part-time, some flex-time. But common to everybody that works there, as Lars, the founder, explained to me, is that they hire people to do what they're good at, rather than hiring them to fulfill a specific function. This not only leads to business in all kinds of unexpected directions, it also creates an air of positivity and excitement whenever you enter their office, their shop or their bars, unlike anything I've experienced elsewhere. And again, this wasn't set up with some grand business idea, just someone who noticed that the young people with diagnoses they were involved with at school age were often left disenfranchised as adults and had the courage and motivation to do something about it. Denmark is also one of the wealthiest countries in the world. This is not something to complain about, but it does mean that Danes consume a lot, especially clothes. 16 kilos per person a year on average, and half of that then ends up in the incinerator when people get tired of it. And that's just the clothes that people buy. Over 670 tonnes of new clothes a year end up in the incinerator. The fumes create greenhouse gases, which as we all know contribute to global warming. So we can't continue buying new clothes in these quantities if we want to save the world from the climate crisis. Social ventures like Vera's Market mean that we don't have to. They're a sustainable clothing company with a circular business model with its own shop and huge markets in urban spaces like motorway underpasses. They realise that it doesn't matter if clothes are actually new. What matters is that they feel new to you. Vera's have contributed to making used fashion cool and have made Rebecca Vera Stanker, the founder, one of the most influential figures in Danish fashion today. So, Denmark is a wealthy country, but not everyone gets to share in that wealth. Settling in as a foreigner, especially with a non-Western background, can be incredibly difficult. And it's not just because of the notoriously tricky language. Sadly, you're not always made to feel welcome. So imagine you're a refugee from, let's say, Syria. You've travelled for weeks, endured incredible hardship and have arrived in what is often referred to as the happiest country in the world, Denmark, a country with seemingly limitless resources, at least compared to where you've just come from. Yet you might not realise that there's a consensus amongst the main political parties, left or right, that in order to protect the Danish welfare state, conditions for refugees should be as difficult as possible to deter others from coming. And it's not just refugees. There's a negative perception of non-Western immigrants amongst many Danes, mainly in the very segments of society where there's the least contact with them. As a consequence, Denmark is one of the most hardline immigration policies in the whole of Europe. Which brings me to Elderlearn. 
They are, in my opinion, a perfect example of how a simple idea can help tackle even the most seemingly intractable social challenges. How can you help non-Western immigrants learn Danish and integrate into a Danish society which might not necessarily want them, whilst at the same time changing perceptions on both sides? You get elderly citizens to act as language teachers, nurturing respect and understanding between people and cultures who might otherwise never have met, just like Esther and Ahmed. Ahmed's 30, Esther's 92. Esther got the social interaction she was missing, Ahmed learned Danish, and both made friends. The truly inspiring thing about all of these businesses is that everyone can be involved. None was set up with a carefully formulated master plan. Just by ordinary people who noticed an imbalance in society and had the courage to do something about it. We can all do it. We can all find our own empowerment through social business and pass that empowerment on to others. Okay, as Lars from People Like Us put it, being involved in a social business might not make you a fortune, but it will enrich your life in far more meaningful ways. So, no matter where you are, who you are, or how old you are, if you want to get involved in a social business, you know, give them a call. They'll want to hear what you can do. If you get struck with an idea which might help the lives of others, act on it. Tell people about your brainwave. You'll be amazed at the network and opportunities that open themselves up. And lastly, if someone talks to you about their social business idea, listen to them without prejudice. You might lose some cynicism. You might be inspired. And if you've lost it, you might find hope. Thank you very much.